Okay, if we could um, draw it together. This is um, the uh, first of our CZO seminar series for the, for the fall, Critical Zone Observatory series for the fall. And we're really happy to have Eric Roden here. He's one of our, he's not an old friend because that would imply he's old, but one of our, <laughs> one of our great friends. And I'll get back to him, but let me give a couple of the announcements for the people in the Critical Zone Observatory, and forgive me if you're not in the CZO. Uh, first of all, the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey Fall Field Conference is October 5 through 7. We're doing a field tour at Shale Hills. It's all day on the 6th, and we need five student volunteers. It's an all-day commitment, but Roman will give you lunch. So that's a pretty good deal. And I think we sent out an email today with all those details, right? Um, this is a... This is a big deal, like 200 or 300 people come. And so we really do need some help. And, and uh, can, can somebody do half in the morning and somebody else do half? Right. Right. And we really need all the CZO folks to, to pony up for this. There's also a poster session on October 5th. And again, contact Roman if you'd like to put up a poster. Um, you have to register online, which is just a liability thing. Uh, any other further details, Roman? Uh, that's about it. I think the, the conference itself, there's a bunch of other field trips associated with it. Most of those are filled up, um, but I don't know how much interest there is among this group for going and looking at uh, geology outcrops and things in the state college. But um, if you do want to present the posters, there's a dedicated like poster session reception on Thursday evening. So that could be a fun opportunity to show your work to, you know, 200 plus geologists around Pennsylvania. It's actually a really fun uh, experience. So, okay, our next seminar in this state in the CZO series is September 15. We do the State of the CZO, and that's where everybody needs to send me uh, an update on their progress, and we kind of talk about the big picture of where we are. Uh, Jennifer wanted me to remind you we have a Twitter account. Um, it, it, we don't have quite the name, the number of followers as our president, but uh, it's at SSHCZO. And anything you want to send to Jennifer, she can tweet about it. So it's actually kind of fun. I, f I follow it. It's interesting. Um, watershed specialist Brandon, do you want to say something, Brandon? Do you want me to just mention the trees? I was just going to mention uh, the trees and things out there in the Shell Hills area. Um, there's a lot of there are a lot of trees down from last week's storm, last weekend's storm. And uh, I mean, some of them are snapped off halfway, a lot of trees that are uprooted as well. So if you're out there, just be careful, watch where you're going. Um, and right now we're gonna stay away from the North Planer mid slope site. There's a tree that's busted off and it's hanging right above the site. So uh, no sampling at that site right now. Um, and we are having some power issues out there still. Uh, it's kind of intermittent and from the shed up to the tower part of it. And I think it's probably because of those trees going up that trail up to the, the tower. A lot of those trees are uprooted right along that trail. So they're probably adding pressure on the power lines and or the, the fiber optic line that's going up there. So we may or may not be missing some data. It's really pretty serious. I mean, you should go and see it. I mean, you can't even get up the north, the little road up to the Meteo Tower. It's really impressive how many trees are down. Um, Data Manager Dan, I don't think you have any announcements. Okay. And uh, Jennifer, the project coordinator, she, any new students in the groups that want to be part of the email list and be involved, they have to get names and email addresses to Jennifer. Okay. All right. Now for the, the real uh, event. We're welcoming Eric Roden here and his graduate student, Stephanie Naparowski. I had to look because to get her name right. Um, so Eric is, like I said, a great friend. He's been here a number of times before. He's at University of Wisconsin. He's been involved in some of the other projects at Penn State, some of the other big projects. And so we uh, are glad to welcome him back. Just to give you a little bit of his background, um, he got a bachelor's at Lebanon Valley College, which I think is where Governor Corbett got his degree, our previous governor, the one that cut us by $200 million or something. So hopefully you have better news. <laughs> he grew up in Harrisburg. He got his PhD in Maryland in marine estuarine and environmental sciences. And he said it was one of the early first big interdisciplinary, uh, you know, PhD granting programs, which is, you know, and he's been very interdisciplinary in his whole career. 
He postdoc at the US Geological Survey with Derek Lovely, who you can understand why he went there because he works on iron geomicrobiology, which I think is uh, what uh, Eric will be talking about today. He then postdoc or worked um, at Pacific Northwest National Northwest Laboratory with John Zakra. Then he was 12 years at Alabama and 12 years at Wisconsin. And I don't know where the next 12 years are going to be. Maybe they're still going to be at Wisconsin. And really, he's, he's the person to talk to about iron geomicrobiology. So we're really pleased to have him here. He's out here because uh, Stephanie wanted to put some sam take some samples and put some samples down into the Shale Hills wells. And I think you'll hear little pieces of the big picture. So welcome, Eric. those who have helped uh, us in the past couple days, and I have a feeling uh, we're going to be back. I mean, we're going to be back at least one time, uh, probably more than that, and I will explain briefly what we're doing here uh, in this current campaign. Um, so um, we're going to talk about something called extracellular electron transfer, and my esteemed PhD student suggested that I take a, a little um, playbook from, what's the guy's name again? Steve Buscevi. And I, I borrowed Sue's water rock interaction hat specifically for this and tell you that we're going to be doing EET in the CZ. <laughs> Did you get me? <laughs> yeah, that's probably the lightest moment we're going to have here because I'm about to start drilling you with this. Just kidding. Um, right, so... Um, just very quickly, uh, so Stephanie, and then you'll see these other people and, and what they contributed as we go. Um, for the most part, I'm the mouthpiece, and it's these smart people that did all this stuff, and, and especially with respect to the genomic parts that we'll talk about. So um, here's a, here, the, uh, there's Liz and Genia, so we'll start with her stuff. Then we'll move on to what Stephanie's doing. Xiaomei is the bioinformatics uh, mastermind. And these are some other grad students. But, you know, it's a pretty small crew. <laughs> it's a pretty small crew, and we help each other, and especially, again, with this genomic business, which was not anybody's expertise uh, except for Xiaomei. So um, iron, as Sue said, that's really my – she asked me this morning, do you work on anything but iron? And I was thinking, I was like, well, kind of. But in the end, it always involves iron somehow. And that's fine. I mean, you know, you got to pick something, right? So I just put this thing together. I've had this slide for a while. You know, there's iron everywhere, right? You know, unconsolidated sediments, consolidated sediments, ancient sediments, banded iron formations, hot springs, you know, you name it, there's iron everywhere, fourth most abundant element in the crust. So, um, and of course, it, it undergoes redox cycling. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it can be catalyzed by microbes. So that's what we're going to deal with. Um, so another little, you know, humor, attempt at humor is we're, we're going to take a ride on, on the Ferris wheel, the microbial Ferris wheel specifically. And there's two sides to this. Um, over on this side, you have the utilization of iron in its ferric state as an electron acceptor for respiration. So microbes can respire with iron oxides like we use oxygen, okay? That produces reduced iron, and if, you, if these kinds of things come together, then you've got a redox boundary. Um, and then the reduced iron can be used by microbes. So these are called chemoorganotrophs. So they get uh, chemical e energy from organic matter. Trophy means feeding, okay? These guys use the reduced iron as an energy source, and we call that chemolithotrophy because it's energy from an inorganic compound, okay? And, um, up until recently, I've been giving talks about how these things come together, and there are certain elements of that today, but really today I'm going to focus on this side, and it's really more of a kind of a weathering-oriented talk as opposed to a, you know, coupled reduction and oxidation of iron. So, oh, whoops, sorry. Um, the key thing here is it's extracellular electron transfer, and you're going to hear, e, I'm going to call it EET, and you're going to hear that repeatedly here. Um, so I thought I'd start with something that may be familiar to some people, um, especially this thing on the right. This is an iron-reducing bacteria. And pe people here, actually, people here at uh, Penn State, colleagues of, of Su, Ming Tian, did some act actual seminal work on this stuff. So this is an iron reducer that's using iron oxides to respire with, but they're insoluble at neutral pH. 
So that means they're taking electrons from inside the cell and depositing them on iron outside. This is a culture of organisms that use soluble ferrous iron. And they do not want, this is a neutral pH, this is all neutral pH, they do not want iron oxides inside the cell for obvious reasons. So they do the job outside, so then they're gonna bring, they'll bring the electrons in from outside. And so these are kind of conventional known types of iron cycling microbes. And in a way, we're kind of gonna bring these together because what I'm gonna talk about is utilization of insoluble ferrous iron as an electron source for this type of organism. Okay, so um, EET, and specifically iron-based EET. So um, we, I, I, I've actually, I like this figure. I think it does what we needed to do in a diagrammatic way. And so it's basically reproducing this, but in a diagrammatic form. Oops, like, looks like I got them reversed. Well, that's a screw up. Anyway, so here's the iron reducers taking organic matter and, uh, putting it into the mineral, and here's the, an organism using mineral, uh, mineral electrons, in this case, ferrous iron, and the electrons go into the cell. This is an outer membrane protein, okay? And that's the business end of EET, at least for the systems that we're, I, so we understand it now for what we're talking about today. And it turns out these kind of outer membrane proteins are present in both types of these organisms. They're not necessarily the same proteins, but the idea is the same, okay? So um, today, we're talking about microbes using minerals to get energy, okay? And uh, you'll see this again. These are microbes associated with uh, pyrite framboids. This is a cryo-SEM image from Clara Chan's group at Delaware. Uh, so microbe plus mineral equals energy. Um, so we're gonna do two, uh, two examples, two case studies one that deals with pyrite weathering uh, out at a subsurface redox transition in Washington State. Um, and this is the PhD work of, of Liz Persak Dennett. And then um, a less complete, but extremely interesting and promising project that is Stephanie's project down at the Lukio uh, Critical Zone Observatory that uh, Sue has also been involved with for a long time. Um, so, in terms of methods, I just put this in there as sort of a placeholder. So we measure things in situ, we do culturing, but you know, in bold is the genomics because that's what we didn't used to do until we, until we got Chalmay and, and she helped everybody figure out how to make sense of this stuff. So, but really, so if you go back and you look at these two things, it's a tale of two fronts. Um, and they're both what you would call nominally weathering fronts, although, this is a real weathering front. This one is kind of a strange thing that is some kind of hybrid. But the concept is the same. You've got a place where reduced iron is being contacted by oxidants, either oxygen or nitrate or both. And that sets up, you know, there's free energy there and the microbes want free energy and so that's the idea. Okay, so before we do these two fronts though, I wanna prep you by showing you some experimental work with a culture, it's not a pure culture, that wasn't from a weathering front, but that gives you a sense of what we're dealing with here, okay? And this is the work of a uh, former colleague, Evgenia Shelabolina. I hope you can see some of this. Um, this is biotite uh, with a, mixed cul a culture of mixed organisms. And I'm, I'm gonna go through this quickly, but th this is ferrous iron. This is the amount of ferrous iron you can ex extract with dilute hydrochloric acid. So if you don't have microbes, it does not react. And this is nitrate driven now. The culture uses nitrate, not oxygen. The iron two goes down, cells grow. Nitrate is utilized. Again, if you don't have, you don't, if you don't have any organisms, the nitrate is not utilized. And there's release of potassium. If you don't have cells, there's no release of potassium. So this is microbial acceleration of biotite weathering by oxidation of Fe2, which is the known to be the rate limiting step for biotite weathering, okay? To our knowledge, this was the first demonstration of insoluble iron two based lithotrophy, okay? And uh, Hui Fang Zhu at Wisconsin did this just lovely high res TEM. And what you see, this is the altered stuff. You see these are the little balls of iron oxide that are popping out from the, 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 uh, the layers as a result of charge imbalance, okay? 
So that's the, that's the, like the geochemistry part. And we also did the genomic part to this. So here Xiaomei comes along. First thing she did with us was to take this culture, this was published recently, and to get the DNA, and we'll talk about this, and try to find out what's in there and how it might work. Uh, so we don't need to worry too much about this, but I got a point. This is called an um, a emergent self-organizing map uh, developed by Germans 30 years ago, looking for patterns in data. It was not designed for genomics. I think it was originally designed for traffic, analysis of traffic patterns or something. Well, it, it basically recruits pieces of DNA sequence into regions that correspond to the same organism. And by use of this technology and other technologies, you can actually reconstruct the genetic content, the makeup, if you will, the genome of microorganisms, not in pure culture, simply by getting DNA from the sample and reconstructing it. So take Humpty Dumpty apart and put it back together again, right? Um, and uh, as it turns out, um, one of these guys, this Gallianaceae, uh, this guy here, was a, a, a known type of organism, and she was able to, to uh, illustrate what we think is the mechanism for, for how this happens. So this is metagenomics. You get DNA, you fragment it. So you, here's where you take Humpty Dumpty apart. Then you sequence Humpty Dumpty, and then you put it back together, ultimately with these so-called draft genomes that you can look for functions, and all this stuff is automated now. So any person, any, anybody in this room, if you wanted to, could learn to do this. It's not black magic anymore, okay? The pipelines are there. I'm not saying it, I'm necessarily suggesting it. So here's one possible mechanism. Here's, our, here's the idea. There's the, here are the electrons on the outside. And this model, I'll get to this. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. So this, here is an, and this is a porin. So the green thing is a porin, which is a pore in, this, in the outer membrane of the cell. And sorry, I have to tell you, these are all gram-negative bacteria. So they have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane is on the out block. So the porin fits in, uh, traverses the outer membrane. And then you have a cytochrome, which is basically a molecular wire composed of anywhere from you know, 10 to 12, whatever, cytochromes, which are heme groups. And that's how you make the connection between the outside of the cell and the inside. Okay. And so these are two pure cultures of iron oxidizers. And these are, this is a genetic map of those guys. And they have the MTOA, which is the wire, and MTOB, which is the pore. And the reconstructed genome of this guy, this Gallianella, has the exact same genetic structure. Okay. So there's that. And then there's some other stuff here that I'm not going to dwell on. We're, this is not the system that we're necessarily looking at today. But again, I wanted to show this to sort of warm you up to it. And this is really a, a kind of key, uh, it illustrates a key invention of life. These are probably ancient metabolisms, by the way. For iron reducers, you've got the opposite system. I mean, you've got the same system, but the electrons are going the other way. You've got a porin, and you've got the wire, and the cells are using it to pump them out. Here, it goes the other way around. But isn't it striking that it's the same invention, right? For the, for the same basic purpose, EET. -E okay, so a molecular machine to move electrons from the outside to the in or vice versa. Okay. And uh, again, time is too short to go through all this. You, know, you can look through the whole genome and put together a, a whole story for how the, the culture functions. And that was that paper. Um, so um, this is a new paper that Xiaomi uh, just got, just came out in Frontiers in Microbiology. This is kind of what we've been talking about, but I want to pre preview this. This is different than this system, uh, and it's a transmembrane-based electron conduit, and I'm going to blow that up for you. And um, this is the one we're probably interested in, I think, but the idea is the same. You have a protein that's in the outer membrane that traverses that membrane. It's not a porin. It's a protein in the outer membrane. And it has the ability, through the presence of a single heme group, a single iron-containing group, to move the electrons. And um, the one that we're interested in is called SciC2. And so we're going to call this the SciC2 homolog mechanism. 
It's different than the pour and wire one, but the concept is the same. Okay, and so there's that concept in simple terms. Okay, so let's go ahead now. So this is a, this redox transition in Miocene age. Uh, this is a, a lacustrian uh, deposits, you know, way before the, all the floods and stuff out west. And about 18 meters down, the material, uh, very rich in clays and stuff, uh, changes from brown to uh, gray or, you know, and, and so this is oxidized and this is reduced. So this is that redox transition zone. And what you have, these are measurements of oxygen and nitrate and sulfate over here. What you have are these oxidants just pouring down into this, just pouring into that reduced zone. And um, notice there's an uptick in sulfate there, and we'll come back to that. You can probably see this coming um, a mile away. Uh, there's pyrite and siderite in, in addition to a whole bunch of reduced clays down in, in the reduced zone. So going back to, oh, and this was, this paper just came, we, you think, boy, that Roden must publish papers like crazy. No, this has just been a good couple years here. Uh, this one, uh, Kirk Kahnhauser, the editor of Geobiology, was kind enough to, to put this image. This is the same one that I showed in the beginning one. And uh, I should tell you, like, if he says, oh, I need a snappy title. I was like, I asked my wife, she's a smart person, got any ideas on this? She goes, well, it's fool's gold. You gotta put that in there somewhere. So it's fool's gold food. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought I had another slide. Let me see, do I have one? No, okay, um, basically the hypothesis behind this, oh yeah, there it is. This could be a zone of chemolithotrophy. You get all this reduced material, oxidants coming in. Maybe they are reacting vis-a-vis -vis microbes. Uh, so this was Liz's PhD thesis. There she is, you know, victorious after her defense. Um, and so she did kind of what we do, which is, Pretty simple. We get material and we put it in bottles and we let it incubate and then we look to see what happened. And then we look at the microbes in there. I mean, I'm simplifying, but it's not particularly high tech. So she had, you know, she tested all sorts of different compounds as potential sources of energy for lithotrophs. And um, I'm not bore you with all the details. I mean, there was pyrite with nitrate, iron monosulfate with nitrate, elemental sulfur in there. And then we were monitoring for the oxidation of these things. There were clays and stuff too, but I'm, we're not talking about. But you know, so here we are a couple, whatever, several months into this, and the only culture that was doing anything was the pyrite plus oxygen. And if you look at that, you go, okay, something was happening. So if it was not autoclaved, a lot more sulfate came out. So living microbes, much more sulfate. Dead microbes, much less sulfate. Okay, so this is pyrite oxidation mediated by bacteria, obviously. So um, th these things were done with synthetic framboidal pyrite that we had to figure out how to get it clean of elemental sulfur and stuff. So it's actually a mixture, mostly pyrite. There's a little bit of um, the, um, the polymorph, McCarthy, uh, uh, McCar Marcosite in there, that's no big deal. Um, but then here's the cool thing, she transferred it. This is what you do in microbiology. You get a culture, it does something, you go, hey, I wonder if it can keep going. If it can, Julie, this, you know, this is, the, you know, demonstrate the phenomena and that you can believe, you know, transfer it and make the same thing happen. And it did, you know, 15 generations over a period of 300 days. And, you know, the, the living ones, there were two of them, uh, these are the transfer points. Um, the living ones produced a lot more sulfate than the, than the non-living. And Hui Fang again uh, did some lovely TEM, and so just as you'd imagine, you're forming a layer of amorphous iron oxide right on the surface of, so this is the unaltered pyrite, and there's the, the sort of the, the, this is the rind, if you will, the, the oxidized rind. Um, and we got just enough uh, X-ray spectroscopy data to that we needed to see whether yes or no, there were any other sulfur phases or iron phases associated with this material. So this is Thomas Borsch and Amrita, I'm just gonna let that go, uh, wonderful person. Um, so um, the Zanes showed the extent of oxidation um, and the XAFs revealed that the only peak in the spectra was reduced S. Uh, there was, and um, there was 
th this is, um, so these are, you know, these are the cultures. This is unoxidized. This is unreactive. This is a, a spectra for sulfate. So there's no elemental sulfur and there's no sulfur containing iron compound, no sulfate containing iron compound. So the pyrite is going directly to sulfate. Okay. A lot faster if you have microbes there. Okay. Okay. The, nobody had shown this before. And, and you know, the, 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 the older geochem, or maybe the younger people, everybody said, why didn't anybody look for this? I think everybody just assumed it was an abiotic reaction. So um, Clara Chan at Delaware, uh, I don't want to tell you a whole bunch of stories, but I got down there with these samples to do the fancy cryo SEM. She goes, well, did you stain it for just a regular stain? I said, uh, uh, whoops, no. So two minutes later, she puts some cytogreen, a DNA stain on it, and puts it under a light microscope, or her epifluorescent microscope. The cells are all over the pyrite grains, and there's nothing outside of them. There, there are no floating cells. They're all on the pyrite. So the next day, we, uh, they freeze the stuff, crack it open, and visualize the cells in amongst these framboids of pyrite. So direct association of the py with the, the pyrite grains. So you knew this was coming, genomic analysis of the culture. Here's that same uh, emergent self-organizing map. Um, near complete uh, reconstruction of the genomes for four dominant organisms uh, in the culture. And um, one of them, Brady rhizobium, which anybody knows anything about soils, you go, isn't that a symbiotic nitrogen fixer with uh, legumes, soybeans? And the answer is yes. But it also appears to be a lithotroph. Um, when we first discovered this, I, I, th we had found this organism before. And I was said to, this was when Jenny was doing this. I said, Jenny, this is a mistake. Brady rhizobium is a soil microbe. Well, this is a lesson for all the, this is for the young people. We went back into the literature and had found that 20 years ago, somebody had showed that Brady rhizobium could grow autotrophically with hydrogen as the energy source. So then, then I said, well, okay then, Brady rhizobium. So this thing was in our cultures and it has the full CO2 fixation system uh, called Rubisco. Okay. We'll come back at the very end of that. So this guy can grow, and by the way, those cultures, there was no organic matter. So, you know, 300 days worth of growth, not a single lick of organic matter added. So these guys were using the pyrite as the energy source to create new versions of themselves with zero added organic carbon. So autotrophic, like a plant, but growing on reduced mineral instead of light. Um, there's something called SOX, which is involved in the oxidation of soluble uh, sulfur compounds, thiosulfate. There were small amounts of those things in these cultures, and that's fine, and it makes sense that, um, that, that these organisms would have that. And yet, we're not necessarily convinced that, that the sulfur oxidizing enzyme, I'm, I'm sorry, we just don't have time to go through all this. We, we're not convinced, we don't know, but we're not convinced that that's how the pyrite is being oxidized. Um, there's another possibility. So here would be oxygen reacts abiotically, and this is known, produces thiosulfate, and then that's used by the microbes. That's possible, and I'm sure it was happening in these cultures. But there's another possibility, which is that they have this outer membrane cytochrome business, and that they can go directly after the mineral. But Remember, I've just been talking blah, blah, blah about how it's iron-based EET, okay? Well, now you're talking about oxidation of sulfur by EET, Eric, yeah, what gives with that? Um, well, one thing is um, the reconstructed genomes from the Brady rhizobium, and this brings us back to that CyC2, remember that transmembrane thing? Uh, this guy has a potential CyC2 homolog in it. So this is the heme, and this is 18 transmembrane binding sites. And, you know, there's some other things in there, um, but we're thinking, well, these are iron, known to you be used by iron oxidizers, not sulfur oxidizers. So then again, I'd probably sound like a, a grizzled vet. Um, we went back to the literature, so you can, you, you can appreciate this. 
Yeah, yeah sorry. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what, um, we went back to the literature and found that in 1991, there was a paper on the abiotic reaction of oxygen with pyrite. Moses and Herman. And, you know, you read through this paper, figure nine, you finally get to the end. And they propose the following mechanism, which is that the electrons, I'm just going to say this, the, the diagram kind of shows it. The electrons are moving from the sulfur to the oxygen vis-a-vis -vis a layer of sorbed iron. And that layer of sorbed iron flips back and forth between ferric and ferrous. So there's, it's ferrous, reacts with oxygen, gets converted back to ferric. Electrons conduct up, because pyrite's a, conducting, a conductive mineral, converts the ferric back to ferrous, and so on and so forth. Um, that's what they hypothesized was the primary mechanism for the oxidation of pyrite by oxygen at neutral pH. And now you can see how the light bulb starts to come on. It's like, well, hey, Eric, the, guy, the organisms in the culture look like they have the genetic potential to be iron oxidizers. So the obvious speculation is, is that these guys, I'm just going to skip, whoops, I'm going to go back to this one. The obvious speculation is, is that the organisms are acceler accelerating this reaction. That is the reaction of oxygen with a surface layer of iron. Okay. Superficially analogous to the biotite oxidation and superficially analogous to what we'll talk about next with respect to silicates. Okay. So, um, just last fall, we were actually getting ready to come to, to Shale Hills. We, we were already planning this, but we said to ourselves, is it really ubiquitous? I mean, you know, because you only showed it this one place. So we went to the pond behind my house and got a little bit of sediment from the pond, shook it up, put it in with some pyrite. Yep, guess what? It worked. This is the framboidal pyrite. This one it wasn't quite as robust, but they, the cells, they were definitely getting energy. Here's ATP. But this is different. This is ground specimen pyrite. And this is, we did this because that's what we are going to talk about in a second, but it's out in shale. And it worked. Much less sulfate, because this stuff's much bigger. These are, this is really, this is like, you know, these are nanometer sized crystallites that form these framboids. Uh, but they made ATP too. So um, based on all of this, um, you know, this is just some basic implications. You know, it looks like this could be a common process. This could be functioning in a lot of different kinds of uh, so-called chemolithotrophic systems. Um, it probably plays, um, oh boy, look at this. This was, this was from ACS last year. Sue had just given a talk. And I forgot to I'll just leave it in there forever. Um, this could be involved in early, the start, the early uh, onset of, of acid mine drainage because I mean, it doesn't start off acidic. So in the very beginning stages, this could play a role in it. Um, and this could also have implications for the early earth. There's a lot of controversy about, you know, when and how sulfate started getting delivered to the, to the early oceans. Uh, so this doesn't prove that. Uh, but I thought I'd pull this paper out of, um, so these are uh, surface area normalized biotic and abiotic rates from Liz's experiments. And this was a paper um, in Nature Geoscience of, in 2009 that was talking about this issue of when did sulfur cycling start happening on the land, and these are, this is, these are like model, sort of model calculations based on mass balance and isotopes. And you can read that conclusion there briefly. But so this is the difference between biotic and abiotic, and this is their calculated difference back in the day. So, you know, okay, it's not quite that big, but it's certainly big enough to um, account for the modern difference. And in this paper, like so many papers about sulfur cycling, they talk about acid mine drainage. It's all acidic pH. You know, I asked myself, well, is, was, all, was the entire early earth, you talk about all this sulfate going, was the entire early earth an acid mine drainage site? I think not. My gut tells me no. So neutral pH pyrite oxidation could have been happening back then. We don't know if they can use really low amounts of oxygen. Obviously, that would have been a, a factor back then. Okay. So uh, quickly now, this brings us to Shale Hills, um, and this is, uh, I'm going to whip through this here. Sue has, and her colleagues have this hypothesis that there's a weathering front, a pyrite weathering front, certainly supported by the geochemical data there. So above the front, the pyrite's gone. Below, it's, it's there, right around the water table. 
Um, and so you've, you can read what she wrote in this paper. And so basically, we are here to try to test that using our microbiological methods. So yesterday, we were out there. Oh, yeah, here's, this is an illustration of the, of the weathering front. Um, so this is actually close. It's not the same well, but it's, this is re really right where we were. So those of you familiar, which, which probably you all are. So we're up here in this one. Um, and we, we, all, we also did this at this. Um, actually, we switched this to a different. It doesn't matter. So here's Stephanie. Uh, lowering these little bags of minerals. So you either got sand and some ground up shale provided by uh, Jennifer and Virginia. And thanks very much, Virginia and Brandon, for taking us out there. And then the other treatment was sand plus shale plus a gram of that ground up specimen pipe. So we're hoping that the stuff gets colonized and that we can document the presence of organisms that do this, et cetera, et cetera. We'll bring it back. We'll do the DNA sequencing and culturing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the next uh, expedition. Uh, hopefully it's not a fool's errand. <laughs> this is so good, isn't it? Uh, I, I just love the fool's gold. Uh, it's glib, but it, it captures the idea perfectly. So, okay, let's talk about iron silicates now. So this is the second weathering front. Um, and this is Luquillo watershed, Luquillo Mountains uh, in Puerto Rico. And probably at least some of you guys are familiar with the really rapid weathering. So it's a, a quartz diorite with relatively large quantities of biotite and hornblende. So these are ferrous iron bearing uh, components of the quartz diorite. And um, this was the work of Heather Buss over 10 years ago, her PhD work here with Sue. And uh, there's Heather and uh, she, she went down there with Stephanie, uh, not this year, but last year. And then Stephanie went back on her own this year and uh, Sue, of course, and Scott was down there. A bunch of other people helped us out. And so um, back in this paper from 2005 from Heather, um, they noticed that th this is iron. There's a bunch of iron up top. That's undoubtedly from probably from iron reduction near the surface. It's organic rich. But then there was this uptick in, in ferrous iron. So this is the, the bidding, this, this is the weathered regolith uptick in, or not uptick, but you know, this is the, the, the bedrock iron. And strangely enough, they saw upticks in the relative amounts of, of, of apparent upticks in the relative amounts of microbial biomass. So this was DNA extractions, and this was cell counts. So something could be happening down there, and that was the hypothesis of this paper. Um, so again, a hypothesis based on, uh, you know, in situ geochemistry, and clever thinking, clear thinking on the part of Sue and her colleagues. And now, you know, the microbial team comes in and says, well, what can we find out about this? And, and by the way, the, the, her, the whole message of this paper was that this could be a subsurface chemolithotrophic community based on weathering of the bedrock. You know, this is big stuff. It has implications for Mars. Well, okay, there's no quartz diorite on Mars, but it has implications for life on other worlds and all this stuff. This work is actually funded by an astrobiology program. Um, so Stephanie went down there. So um, just this is an outcrop, but this is the idea, and you guys, some of you know this already, well, obviously, been with Sue, the Rhinelet zone. So this is bedrock, and it sort of turns into these Rhinelets, and this, so this is the zone of weathering, and uh, Sue and we were discussing some more advanced ideas about exactly how things work, but the whole idea is that this is a zone of chemolithotrophy. So these are reproduced uh, from Heather's paper. Um, and so this is the hypothesis of Stephanie's uh, component of Stephanie's thesis um, is that the rock is turning into the saprolite. So rock to regolith vis a vis the activities of, yep, you guessed it iron oxidizing bacteria that make their living by extracellular electron transfer. Um, and uh, you can see this term here. Um, uh, I was at a meeting and I was telling some guy, Mike Wilkins, who's now at Ohio State, um, about this and how we're gonna sequence it and we're gonna get metagenomics. He goes, well, you're after the weathering microbiome. And I said, thank you, Michael. That is exactly what we're after. So it's our term now. But I wanted to mention another term that hit me when we were out in the field the other day. Is you hear, one hears of chemical weather. Well, broadly speaking, this is biochemical weather. In this case, mediated by what is presumably an ancient 
invention of bacteria, that is extracellular electron transfer. Okay, so um, this was uh, Stephanie last summer. So taking samples, uh, went, went the whole way down, but then of course the focal point was the, the Rhinelet zone. Well, basically where you can't put the, the auger in anymore. Uh, she sampled three different sites. Uh, this map is from uh, another of the papers from uh, that body of work, a, a different PhD student. The, the, the locations are of no particular consequence. Um, and this came, this data came early because, you know, we got the stuff back and did the ATP. And I'll tell you, this made us feel very good because um, we saw the same thing that Heather did. So here's the, um, this is the, this is iron. So this is now looks like, you know, bedrock or the Rhinelet stuff that still has unweathered rock. And look at this uptick in, in ATP as a measure of biomass. And as Stephanie's pointed out, and you had some sort of snazzy way of showing it graphically, this isn't just, you can use it as a measure of biomass, but what this tells you is that there are cells down there, right? That are, that have ATP. It's an energy currency. It's not just a cell could be sitting there doing nothing. They have ATP, right? So uh, an analogous approach, do enrichment culturing. Um, she used a number of different iron sources. You know, the ones you'd imagine, the components of the uh, rock itself, some other stuff, controls. And one of them was the ground up uh, country rock the diorite itself, that had been, you know, it was from an outcrop, but they cut the, the weathered part away, so it was the pure rock. Uh, shatter box, grinding, for less than 45 micron fraction. Um, so we're obviously, you know, manipulating, we're cheating. It's not pieces of rock, it's ground up rock. Um, and, you know, just a sort of basic artificial groundwater. Again, this is of no particular consequence. Um, and um, as we have done, we, we monitor oxidation, not bulk oxidation of all the iron two in the rock. We just measure what, how the, the amount of iron two in a dilute hydrochloric acid extract is there. So it's a proxy for, well, I'm not sure how much of the iron, but the HCl is gonna strip the surface. And assuming the cells are basically living at the surface, it's stripping off the iron that it was, you know, used by the cells, or not, if there weren't any cells. And measure ATP, and this is actually a really nice approach. Uh, I can recommend it. If, you, if anybody in the room needs an assay for microbes, this is the best one. It is way, way, way easier than doing cell counts, extracting DNA, which is its own problem in these kinds of materials, and Stephanie knows all about that. So, um, so the idea here, uh, rock equals food. So there's the ground up diorite. And um, I'm not gonna show all of the results that Stephanie has, just some tidbits that are encouraging. Uh, she's continuing on with this and the sampling of, of these cultures in particular is continuing to, to go on. So here's the iron over here and uh, the, the blue circles are controls. So these are, this is oxygen, so full oxygen. So this is the ground up rock, sterile fluid with oxygen. It does not react with the, the diorite on the time scale of a PhD student's thesis, okay? No oxidation. But if you have microbes that came from samples, you know, from, you know, down at, down at the point of ref refuse, refusal, deep as you can go, hand augering, then it drifts down. I don't, I don't know what, these are, I hate these data points over here, but you know, this is a clear trend and these guys are going straight down and it's continuing to go down. Is the red one going down again? Oh, good, okay. But you know, here you go, this is the ATP. Is this, again, this is important. So microbes are getting energy from the rock. And we, by the way, we didn't add any organic matter, nothing like that. So microbes growing on rock, so rock equals food. 
Um, so this is, uh, I think this is just a wonderful place to, to look at this the idea that life on Earth, potentially other worlds, can be sustained over long periods of time uh, through this kind of uh, meta metabolic process. Um, and uh, Sue can tell you all about this in great detail, but it seems possible that the, the activity of these microbes is actually participating in an integral way into the weathering itself. You know, if you start to alter charge balance in some of those iron bearing phases, that can weaken the rock and then it can crack and then the weathering keeps going. That, of course, is going to open up new porosity. That's going to open up new habitats for the microbes. And then they go and they got new places to grow and the whole thing just goes on. And eventually you go from, whoops, sorry, you go from that to that. Uh, by the way, no idea how to translate the, the bottle experiments to in situ. Although the modeling exercise that's in that 2005 bus at all paper is probably as close as you can get to trying to do that. Um, so uh, Stephanie is further along with this than uh, we're winding down now, further along with this than, than I'm going to show you today. These are the, th the three sites, the three inocula. The communities were different. I'm not sure that means much. This is just uh, based on a, a phylogenetic marker gene. Um, but she has um, some metagenomic information, both from the in situ materials and, and her cultures. Um, and so this, th this is a problem. The intact community is so complicated at a genetic level. This is one of these ESOM maps. It doesn't look very good. And, you know, if you, and then just sort of draw your eyes over here, this is from one of her cultures. Still quite complex, hasn't figured it all out, and I think you would agree that meant, you can even just see, these bins are, we call them bins or regions, are, are not clean. There's a lot of complexity there. But this looks better than this. So um, we have a, a, a small amount of money, hopefully enough, uh, from UW-Madison, a uh, so-called microbiome initiative, uh, to, to try to use advan more advanced sequencing technologies to try to tear into the, the actual complexity. Meanwhile, the fallback position is to, if necessary, use that same technology just to understand the cultures. And in, in the end, that may be what happens. But it's the same idea, you know? interrogate genomic potential, link that to experimental things, that gets tied back to the field, and that's the story. Um, I'm gonna skip that and show this. So this is um, now from reconstructed genomes uh, from her cultures. And remember that SciC2 homolog thing? This is the, the transmembrane protein with a heme in the middle that conducts electrons across the outer membrane. So, and these are, not fully reconstructed, but enough to be able to say which taxa these gene systems are in. And so here it is. This, these are the transmembrane uh, properties. And this is the heme, heme binding group. And I may not have mentioned, but this is the proven SciC2 system in a, in a known iron oxidizer uh, that functions at low pH. So, um, Again, these are from reconstructed genomes, okay? So we can't prove that that's what's happening, but it sure is interesting to see that. It's also interesting that some of these guys have Rubisco. So this is, these are the genes for CO2 fixation. Um, and um, in our lab, in our world, if you have a microbe or a, a microbe, pure culture, genome reconstructed from a sample, in situ reconstructed genome or culture, whatever. If that microbe shows genetic potential for extracellular electron transfer, particularly iron uh, oxidation, and Rubisco for CO2 fixation, that's the smoking gun of chemolithotrophy. And to me, that's sort of where we're at with this field. If you can find that, it probably means there's chemolithotrophy. Obviously, what we'd like to be able to do is find that in the materials themselves. We can't, we have not been able to do that yet. 
Uh, another thing we uh, haven't been able to do, and I'll, I'll use this to, to finish off here, is um, prove definitively what the mechanism for in iron oxidation is. Prove it using the techniques of, of you know, full-scale microbiology. So um, this is the diagram from the little proposal that we got uh, funded. So you get in situ samples, do shotgun on that, make cultures, do shotgun on that, reconstruct genomes, do genome fishing. And then there's this side, which is pure culture isolation. And once we, and, and she, uh, Stephanie actually has 10 pure cultures now from uh, the, the, the Lukeo materials, the cultures. And we're in the process of getting their genomes, that's easy. Um, and you know, we're gonna screen to see what they may have. And the beauty of this, and this is outside the workflow of this project, the beauty of this is if you can get a pure culture and prove that it does that reaction, and then use genetics to mutate it, knock out the gene for the, the CYC2 homologue, show that it can no longer carry out iron oxidation, now you have proof. And, you know, the earth scientists perhaps in the room are going, well, okay, geez, that's great. That, I mean, okay, I, I like that, Eric. But other than just, you know, feeling satisfied that you were able to prove something about a microbe, what good is it? You know, I'm a field scientist, for heaven's sake. But the, how's that going to help me, you know, understand the, some weathering front? Well, the answer to that is, and this is not on this diagram, if you can figure out what genes are involved in something, then you can use you can use them as a marker and go looking for that gene in the environment. And for that, you don't need to do, shot, you don't need to do metagenomics. You just need specific tools to look for those genes. And that's the end game here. That's what we'd like to get to. I, I'm sure, you know, we won't get to it probably before I'm retired, but that's the idea. And then once we have that, then we can go to any, you know, weathering system on the planet and, and you know, really try to find out how it works. How are we doing? Well, okay, that did take a while, didn't it? Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and we'll take some questions. Yep. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you definitely have to have water. I mean, the, the key, um, well, the, you know, the groundwater site in Washington, the aquifer with the redox uh, front, it's obviously saturated. Shell Hill's saturated. Um, Lukeo is unsaturated, but it's not dry down there, right? So, I mean, there's water down there. You can pump, it's, it's not saturated, but you can get water. So if you don't have water, you don't have microbial activity. Like, you know, I, I, in my classes, I tell everybody, there's, there's no active microbial metabolism in that carpet now. It's too dry in here. If you get below 60% humidity, well, maybe it's that high in here now, but I doubt it. Below 60% uh, water activity, nothing. Doesn't mean it's dead. But if you pour water on that carpet, it's going to go. So, yeah, you have to have water. Absolute requirement. Dry it out, won't happen. The bugs won't die, though. Yeah, if it, if it dried out, that would stop microbial activity. Well, it depends on how human. It would start right back up again. Yeah. You know what? Well, um, in, in microbiology, we, you get a pure culture and you preserve it by freeze drying it with glycerol to keep the cell from bursting. And those things will, you know, you buy them, they sit in your bench for a while until you wanna grow that organism or you do it yourself. Or you can just freeze them in the minus 80 degree freezer and bring them out and, well, they'd be wet then, but if you lyophilize them, freeze dry them, then you just put them in water, they come right back. I have no idea, nobody does. I mean, you, the people have isolated microbes from, you know, 400, 200 million year old salt crystals. 
Nobody has the slightest idea. They're not dead, but they're not active. It's like the undead. It, this is a true mystery. Nobody has the slightest idea how. They're just there. That's not a very good answer. They're just there. And all you have to do is add water. I mean, I, just as an example, if I may, a colleague years ago, they do experiments on rice paddy and all these different metabolisms in rice paddy under anoxic conditions. Their starting material for all their experiments is a, a, a five gallon bucket full of dry rice paddy soil that's been sitting in the guy's office for 20 years. They put water, you make methane, sulfate reduction. It just comes back. They're not dead, but they're not active. Yes? Yes. Yeah, it looks like, well, the oxygen would be slightly higher up. Um, Liz's result, she did use nitrate and didn't, didn't see any positive hits. Um, but those materials can definitely consume. She had a different, another paper that showed the nitrate gets consumed. But it, it, I, we don't know, we're not sure how active that process is actually in situ. It's not clear. Um, there's a backstory to that, but it's, we'll leave that for another conversation. Yes. No, please go ahead. Well, it, I, in terms of how fast it would go in situ, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to know um, because you're translating the results from, you know, in many ways it's analogous. Um, one, of, one of Sue's many contributions to our science was the, 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 in some cases, very large disconnect between laboratory-based rates of weathering and those in the field. And so we're, we're facing the same problem. You know, we can't translate our biochemical weathering rates from the lab to the field. Um, in terms of acid production, yeah, sure. Um, but if it's buffered, then, and in our experiments, they were buffered. So the pH never changed from, you know, what, 6.9. So we, actually, Lucia was not buffered, but that's the silicate. That, that's a different system. Ours, they were buffered. But in situ, eventually, and I mean, this is really the chicken and the egg, you know, acid mine drainage. Well, it depends on, among other things, the presence of soluble ferric iron as a chemical oxidant for pyrite. That produces soluble ferrous iron, which is then used by acid-loving iron oxidizers. And then they make the ferric iron back again, and, and it all works great because at low pH, the ferric iron is soluble. Well... Um, it's kind of like, you know, the early earth, was it all, did it just somehow magically become an acid mine drainage system? No, when you first start the digging and make the piles of coal and stuff, it doesn't turn acidic immediately. It has to start somewhere. So I'm guessing that in the earliest stages until you get down to a, I don't know what the pH limit of these organisms are. We, we're not even close to knowing that. We don't even have a good pure culture model with which to test that. You can test it with, you know, cultures, I guess, mixed cultures. But so I bet it's crucial to it. And then once it, the pH goes low enough, then boom, it takes. Then the then the acid loving microbes take over, and the mechanism changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Julie. I have two questions. Um, because we know how ancient the ancient cultures were, so well. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good question. There's, a, there's not a bad answer to it also. Uh, and I'll, I'll segue into that with the iron reducers. So the microbes that, that respire with ferric iron, so the electrons going from the inside to the out, um, they're everywhere 
in the, phylog in the prokaryotic domains of life, including down near the root of the, of the 16S uh, ribosome RNA big tree of life. You know, you've all seen this with the domains, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes and so forth. So, and they use EET, although I have to say, the mechanisms for iron reduction by the, the, the hyperthermophiles near the root is not known. But I, based on that, and the fact that the two types of EET seem to be analogous, I'm guessing it's pretty ancient. The other thing is, down near the root, there is an organism called uh, Ferroglobus placidus that can oxidize ferrous iron with nitrate. So there's an, a bona fide example of a deep, so-called deeply branching uh, taxa, it's an archaea, that is near, down near the root. Unfortunately, you guessed it, we do not know how it does that. Uh, so better, I think there's a genome sequence for it. And this is the beauty of this stuff now. You just go to the, you go to the, the database and look. And you think, well, didn't everybody look already? And the answer is, no, heck no. You know, not everybody's thinking about this stuff. Uh, so we should check. It's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, two questions. Um, well, in, if you have soluble ferrous iron, it does. And that is one of the things that kills a culture. Gets iron oxides all over it. And then that screws up the cytochromes that are on the outside, blah, blah, blah. But in our case, there is no soluble iron. It just goes straight to iron oxide. And actually, this gives me a chance to, to mention, I still can't get over those, those images of, of, of sand to, to Julie. I, I, it's even hard for me to say uh, Gertite framboids. I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying that. Because um, I've never heard that. I've never heard of that before. Or, or, I don't know, Peter? No? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go back to it as you're. Yeah, show that these pyrite grains are coated by the kind of what you're calling amorphous iron hydroxide. Yep. Does that stop the reaction? I think it does. I think, I think that does stop it. Because, you know, like for example, in this, the, the very first generation of her culture, it stopped. And just so you'll know, the amount that got oxidized was about 20% of the sulfur. So I'm guessing it's like a passivation type of thing. In nature, of course, something would have to, to, to wipe that away, you know, ligands or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. That I can, I don't think you could say, and this goes to Julie, we were talking about this right before we came over to do the seminar. I don't think you could say that that is a biosignature. You may want to. I mean, you could say, well, we think it's biologically mediated, therefore the end product, in fact, is a biosignature. But whether or not you would get that same biosignature with an abiotic system, uh, we have no idea. And to replace the entire framboid, that's not, Peter, as you, as you pointed out, that is not consistent with what we found. You know, this layer of, of, whoops, uh, layer of oxidized iron, on the surface of the pyrite, it, it, you know, it, these are small things, but it, it's not like it ate up the whole thing. It's almost as if it just got eaten from the outside in until there was nothing left. But, correct. 
It, I don't know. Right. One, I think I can tell you is we did not form pseudomorphs in these experiments. Uh, of course, that stuff's been out there for a long time. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll just go out on a limb and I'll tell you, I think it's dominated by microbes. I mean, you know, it. Well, but I still bet microbes were involved in there somehow. I, and, you know, this is one of these sort of, it's a trite thing to say. If there's a redox, if there's free energy, a microbe will, will harness it. But you know what? There's no not a single piece of evidence to refute that claim. And, you know, if, if we sat down, it would take hours. I could tell you some really, really wacky examples of that. Just crazy sulfur disproportionation. You know, weird reactions, microbes with cables, oxidizing sulfide and sediments. Just crazy stuff where, you know, yeah, it goes abiotically, but if there's a microbe there, it's going to take it. It will take that energy. And related to that, so would there be certain environmental predictors, like gel filters, instead of regenerating the microbes, and would that be a greater amount of microbes? It's, of course, it's an excellent question. Um, the type and the amount of inorganic energy source would make a big difference. Um, you know, if you, do, if you don't have an iron bearing, you know, material that's part of the rock, in other words, lithotrophs aren't going to grow on carbonate alone. Now, somebody, who was it? Somebody was saying, well, what if it, what if you had Fe2 and the carbonate? Then maybe that's what they could be oxidizing. I don't know. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was Dr. Kim, right, was saying that. Um, oh no, wait, who was, oh, was it, no, who was saying it? Somebody pointed that out. I mean, so you never know. Virginia. Oh, Virginia, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so be the type of minerals present. But you know, ferrous silicates and pyrite, pff, those are winning. Those are winners right there. Um, whether or not the type of mineral would dictate the type of EET system or this or that, I, we don't know yet. Um, yeah. um, have you measured the uh, gas chemistry of the phosphate? Well, no, because there's so much oxygen in there. Yeah, I was just wondering whether uh, if this uh, microbe actually gets the food and then. Oh! Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that, but I don't, and it's good, it's good thinking, it's good clean thinking. Um, but I, I don't think that's going to work here. First of all, in our bottles, we put 5% CO2 in the headspace. And that was based on the known gas chemistry of as far down as you, they, that's what's been measured in situ. So, and the amount of metabolism that we're looking here, tiny compared to 5% you know, CO2, you'd never see it. But I can make a comment, though. We want to uh, ultimately, and we're hoping to try this at Shale Hills with the pyrite, use uh, carbon-13 labeled inorganic carbon in an experimental reactor and track its incorporation into DNA. Separate, so then that DNA would be heavy, Separate that heavy DNA from the microbes that grew with that type. It's called stable isotope probing to determine which organisms specifically were fixing CO2. 
And if you only add the CO2, if you only add the, the C13 in the form of CO2, then it has to be that those are the microbes that were fixing it. And hopefully they're the same ones with EET, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that's on the chopping block. But that, of course, would not be a stoichiometric. That's a different, that's different. Yeah. So if you see like slight deviation from the um, one to two to one relationship, then you can guess that there's some other process happening and you can kind of relate that to the microbial process. Well, that would be just astounding. It would be tremendous if, if someone could do that. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. This is in. in, in Okay. So, I mean, yeah, you know what? Oh, now I, I, I have read that paper. I'm, I'm getting old, aren't I? I need to go back and read it again, don't I? Which site was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 the, the Virginia granite, which, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I love that idea. I, yeah, sounds great to me, if, if you could do it. <laughs> Let me just say one thing about your question. So in Bohemia, there's soil and there's satellite, and it's, you know, five, eight meters, and then you get these rhinos that can be And there's oxidation happening across that, those rhinos, so rhinos can be forty centimeters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. I'm going to just click forward. And there's definitely evidence that bacteria are living off that iron oxidation. And, you know, we, we did it kind of quickly and we found it beautifully. But, we, but the evidence that we have is that um, the porosity gets so low as you go into the forest land. I don't actually think organisms. And actually started right. at the very, you know, yeah, they're not going to get into this. They can't get in that, right? So I think it starts. I think it starts in the, and then you know, as these rhinos form and water can get in there, velocity opens up. I think it then becomes bio, biological, right? Yeah. And the little bit of chemical evidence we have for that is that in the outer lines, the iron and manganese actually gets depleted. We think it's moving, so we think there's organic sort of complex that are moving. But then right near the bottom, the iron is moving and it ends up stopping the right. oxidation. That's sort of circumstantial evidence, which is just not a lot of our genetic data in there at all. It can mobilize the model. Yeah. So back to the yeah. you know, the bacteria the bacteria right. are driving this. Well they're driving the outer part of it, but they're not driving the I don't think they can right. they're driving the inner part. Right. And so yeah, that no, I, I got gotcha. you. But the oxygen is passing through the living, and the oxygen is mediated by the bacteria above, which is kind of the story that the, the gins were about. You know, how can you live with the oxygen and the CO2 and still be able to catalyze the Okay, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah.